uh, first, uh, let's talk about the Divorce Act. Um, in every province and territory in Canada, there are two main laws that deal with uh, family breakdown and family restructuring. One is the Divorce Act, which is a piece of federal legislation made by the government of Canada that is common throughout the entire country. But each province and each, and, and each territory has its own domestic legislation. So I'm here in Alberta, and in Alberta we have the Family Law Act and the Family Property Act. In British Columbia, um, it's just the Family Law Act. And so this is important because the Divorce Act only applies to people who are or used to be married to each other. So if you're not married, the Divorce Act doesn't apply to you and you can ignore this. Um, the Divorce Act talks about some really important stuff. Um, it talks about child support, it talks about spousal support, it talks about parenting after separation. And parenting after separation is really what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today but it doesn't talk about property. And so for property issues, that's the stuff that you look at the provincial legislation for. So let's get into this. Um, so um, first of all, uh, there are some really big new changes that are coming down the pipe to the Divorce Act. Um, the resources that you need to be aware of are where you can find the bill that's changing the Divorce Act, and that's at that first address that's on your screen right there. The other thing you can find there is also the address of the current Divorce Act, because all these changes aren't taking effect until the 1st of March 2021. The other thing that's important to know is that last link to the Department of Justice's website. If you just Google Department of Justice Canada, it'll take you to the to Justice's website. Um, when, you when you go there, click on family law, and it will take you to a bunch of information, including this, changes to family law. Now, if you're looking for a high level technical overview, you can click on the button labeled information for professionals, but I'll warn you that it's really written for lawyers and judges and people like that. Um, on the other hand, if you click on the information for families button, this is what you get. So you get information providing an overview about the changes to the Divorce Act that are coming into effect, and you get a nice bite-sized digest about the important changes that are coming about how we talk about parenting after separation. So one button will give you essentially some government information about why they're doing all of this. Um, another button will give you a fact sheet about children's views and preferences and how children's views are taken into account under the new divorce legislation. Um, and another one will give you more information about how the Divorce Act now talks about family violence. So this is so all of this stuff is really important. And when you have the time, I would encourage you to go to the website of the Department of Justice and just play around and, and check out some of the different information that's available. Um, however, one thing that's interesting is that we don't yet have a complete copy of the Divorce Act. In other words, the Divorce Act that exists right now, plus all of the changes that are coming down the pike as a result of Bill C-78. So if you want that, you can go to the website of my firm, which is boydarbitration.ca. And if you go there and then click on the link to the library, which is at the very bottom of the page, you can get two things. Uh, one is my personal unofficial consolidation of the Divorce Act. So that's the current Divorce Act, plus all the changes. And you can also get uh, my overview of the important changes that are being made by Bill C-78. Um, it, it's a, in a narrative kind of format, so it's more of a discussion about the changes rather than a sort of a, what you see in the legislation. Uh, this, by the way, is, uh, is what the, uh, my consolidation of the Divorce Act looks like, and it's handy. So go ahead, get a copy of it, save it on your computer, um, and stuff like this. Uh, and, and the PowerPoint presentation. It's all stuff that you can feel free to hand out to your friends and family members and things like that without the need for getting my permission. So go right ahead. If there's something that you want, take it and distribute it as you wish. So today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the bill, some of the highlights of uh, the changes. We're going to talk about some of the really interesting new duties that parties to a court process under the Divorce Act have, the new duties of lawyers and the new duties of judges. We're going to spend a lot more time talking about the new rules and language that we're going to use to talk about parenting after separation. And then we're going to move on and talk about one of the most important things, which is the Divorce Act's brand new test to help figure out what should happen when somebody wants to move away after separation. And then the last three points there are fairly small. It's little bits of amendments that are being made because of the amendments to the Divorce Act. So let's get into the uh, bill. 
So um, the bill uh, was first uh, introduced by the government into the House of Commons on the 22nd of May 2018. It managed to get all the way through both levels of government on uh, June uh, the 18th of 2019, and it received royal assent three days later, which is, uh, which is how it becomes law. The, the bill was originally supposed to take effect on Canada Day last year. However, because of the coronavirus and some delays on the part of the provinces and territories adapting their court forms to suit the new changes, it all got delayed. That's why instead of coming into force last July 1st, it's now coming into force on the 1st of March, 2021. The big changes, like I said, are about parenting after separation, how we talk about the best interests of the child, the role of family violence in thinking about the best interests of the child, and then all this business about moving after separation. But lots of things aren't changing, and what's not changing are the rules about divorce, including the rules about how Canada deals with foreign divorce orders, the rules about child support and children's special expenses and extraordinary expenses aren't changing. The rules about spousal support aren't changing and neither are the rules about appeals. So the big stuff is really all, the, all these things about parenting after separation, how we talk about the best interests of the child, the role of family violence and thinking about the best interests of children and the rules that are coming into force about how judges are supposed to think about cases where somebody wants to move away after separation. So the new duties, this, this presentation is aimed at everybody who isn't lawyers and mental health professionals. Yesterday was my talk to lawyers and mental health professionals. So this is really going to be the important stuff for you. Under the current Divorce Act, people who are in the middle of a divorce proceeding don't have any particular duties to each other, but they will when the changes take effect. So the first one is, is that under section 7.1 of the Change to Divorce Act, somebody who has parenting time, decision-making responsibility, and contact, and we're gonna talk about all those terms in a second, but they are obliged to exercise the rights involved in those things in a way that is consistent with the best interests of the child. And the best interests of the child are the subject of a very long new test set out at section 16 of the amended Divorce Act. And again, we'll get there in a minute. Another new duty is that the people who are involved in a Divorce Act case are obliged to protect their kids from the conflict resulting from the lawsuit to the best of their ability. And here's what the government has to say about that. Research indicates that children's well-being suffers if they witness conflict between parents during and after a separation and divorce. In the best interests of the child, parents must try to shield children from conflict as much as possible. Of course, some level of conflict is common between divorcing spouses, and it can be difficult to shield children completely. As a result, parties are only required to do their best. Well, the government is absolutely correct. The social science that we have about the effect of parental conflict shows that children can suffer pretty severe short and long-term consequences of their parents' conflict with each other. And the magnitude, the severity of those consequences uh, depends on the intensity of the conflict and the, the length of time for which the, con the, the conflict lasts. So, as far as the effect of this new duty is concerned, it's more of a reminder. I don't think that we're gonna see anybody getting in trouble for failing to shield their, their children from conflict. After all, all you have to say is, well, I did it to the best of my ability, but the principle is still really important. If you're in the middle of a divorce process, it's your job as a parent to make sure that your children don't suffer from the conflict between you and the other parent. Another new duty uh, comes uh, at section 7.3. And what this says is that if you're involved in a Divorce Act case and you're, you, you're dealing with support issues or you're talking about parenting after separation, you have to try to resolve your dispute through a quote, family dispute resolution process. What is a family dispute resolution process? Well, that term is defined in the changes that are coming to the Divorce Act and it includes mediation, negotiation and collaborative negotiation. But it's an open-ended list, so that even though the definition doesn't include arbitration, arbitration is wrapped up in there, as is any other dispute resolution process that we haven't quite figured out yet. So you've got an obligation, as much as it's appropriate to do so, to try to resolve your dispute other than going through court. The interesting thing about this is that I'll tell you, as somebody who's been a family law lawyer since 
oh God, I think it's been 21 years now. I'll tell you that court does nobody any good. Um, court is a difficult process. It's highly adversarial. If you didn't like your ex-spouse before you got to court, you are damn straight not going to like them at all after you're done with litigation. It's really not helpful. It costs a lot of money. And the research that is available about Canadians' satisfaction with different dispute resolution uh, processes and lawyers' views about different resolution processes shows us that litigation takes roughly twice as long and costs roughly twice as much, if not more, than any of these other kinds of dispute resolution process. And so if you can resolve your dispute using mediation or negotiation or even arbitration, you're going to get it done faster, cheaper, and with much less conflict than if you have to resolve it through court. Now there's another new duty, and that other new duty requires the people involved in a lawsuit under the Divorce Act to provide each other with complete, accurate, and up-to-date information if required to do so. Now this ought to be a bit of a no-brainer, right? Uh, but the reason why government introduced this new duty um, is because there's a chronic problem when you're dealing with support issues, uh, child support and spousal support, where people will sometimes not provide all of the financial uh, information that they are required to provide. This is a problem, of course, because, you know, issues about child support and spousal support are almost entirely based on financial information. So typically what you have to provide the other person is your last three years worth of personal income tax returns, your last three years worth of the CRA notices of assessment and notices of reassessment, your most recent pay stub showing your earnings to date. Then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you also have to cough up. And if you happen to own a company or a sole proprietorship or you work for yourself in some other way. So um, the spots in the Divorce Act where there are this obligation to provide up-to-date information is mostly about child support it's also about uh, other legal proceedings that have to do with protection orders, uh, child protection, and criminal orders that are related to the people in your family. Um, you'll also have to produce information about the children's education, their health care, uh, and their general well-being if the other parent of the child asks you to do so. But most importantly, it's really about income information. Then the, then the next new duty, and this is a funny new duty, it says that a person who is the subject of an order is required to comply with that order. This is really weird, frankly, to see in the Divorce Act because it is true. If you're subject to an order, you have to comply with it. And if you don't comply with the order, you might face uh, an application for an order that you be held in contempt of court. Now, being in contempt of court for disobeying a court order is really serious. Among other things, you can be fined. You can be sent to jail. You can be fined and sent to jail, right? So you want to be careful about this and you have to comply with an order. So why does the government think this section is important? It's because some people do not comply with orders related to parenting or support. The amendment aims to encourage compliance by clearly stating the obligation to obey court orders while they are in effect. So it really doesn't do much. Um, the penalties that you'll face if you decide not to obey a court order are still about contempt. This new section 7.5 doesn't really add anything to that, but Think of it as an important reminder. So if you didn't think that you had to comply with court orders, it's a reminder that you do. Um, and then finally, we've just talked about these five different duties. Well, there's a sixth duty. And this duty says that if you are somebody who is starting or responding to a claim under the Divorce Act, you have to certify in the court document that you're using to start or reply to the divorce proceeding that you're aware of what your obligations are under the Divorce Act. But don't worry. This business about certifying isn't any more fancy than having to sign and date above a pre-printed part of the divorce form that says, I'm aware of my duties under the Divorce Act. And I'm gonna show you what that little blurb, the certification blurb looks like at the end of this presentation. Uh, so, uh, and then lawyers have new duties. I mean, and, and frankly, they're not all new. Lawyers have a bunch of duties right now. Um, lawyers are obliged to point out to their clients the parts of the Divorce Act that talk about reconciliation. We are required to talk to our clients about the opportunities for counseling that might help with reconciliation that exists that we're aware of. 
um, we're also now going to be required to encourage our clients to try to resolve disputes about parenting, child support, and spousal support outside of court using one of those family dispute resolution processes. We also have to tell you about the family justice services that are available through the courts that we happen to be aware of. And what exactly those services are depends hugely uh, on where you live. And it's not just the province or the territory where you live, which is which makes things change, but it's also whether you live in a big city or live in a small city. And so the nature of those services, which might be about uh, uh, which might be about helping you find your way through the justice system. They might concern parenting after separation. They might be about helping you work out child support. All those services, whatever they might be, lawyers are required to tell you about them. Not a big deal. Um, and we also have to certify our compliance. That, that's, that's currently a part of the Divorce Act. And it is just like your certificates of compliance, just this little bit at the bottom of the documents that are used to begin or respond to a claim under the Divorce Act. And we just sign that and say, yes, we've done those things. Now, this is a really important new part. The court has a brand new duty. Under Section 7.8, the court is required when it's making decisions about parenting after separation to take into account a civil protection order or a proceeding about a civil protection order, a child protection order and proceedings, agreements, measures and orders that are made in that proceeding um, and anything that is uh, in, uh, involving criminal uh, uh, proceedings involving the people who are the parties to the lawsuit. Now, this is really important uh, and it comes from a bunch of really unfortunate incidents when the court didn't have information that the people who were in front of it on a divorce case were also dealing with criminal charges about, for example, assault, battery, stalking, wrongful imprisonment, and a whole bunch of other really horrible things. And so when the court makes these sorts of decisions without knowing that there's a child protection proceeding that's relevant to what's going on, or that there's a criminal proceeding that's relevant to what's going on, there's a risk that the judge might make an inappropriate order and leave the children with somebody who is potentially a risk to them. So this is all about helping the judge in a divorce case know about all the other legal proceedings that are involving the people in the divorce case so that the judge can make a better and more informed decision. The problem though, is that the court proceedings that the court staff enter into uh, information about divorce cases are different than the computer systems that are used in child protection cases and different than the computer systems that are used in criminal cases. Uh, so the computers don't talk to each other. So it's not the case that when you're typing in the new information about a brand new divorce claim, that automatically what pops up is a list of all the criminal stuff and the child protection stuff that the same people might be involved in. And so um, I, what I hope this produces is it encourages the provinces and the territories to spend some money um, making their systems talk to each other so that this kind of information is more readily available. Now, the court has other duties and those duties still exist and they're not changed as a result of the changes to the Divorce Act. Among other things, the court is required not to give you a divorce order if it thinks that, it, that there's a possibility of reconciliation. Um, Another rule is that the people that help you reconcile, such as a marriage counselor or a social worker or a psychologist or a registered clinical counselor, they cannot be made to come to court and give evidence about the things that you talked about during their effort to reconcile. Other rules are that the court can't give you a divorce order if it thinks that you've been sneaky about arranging to get your divorce by colluding with each other, by conspiring and doing all these other things. Um, and then finally, the court isn't able to give you a divorce order if you're if you have kids and you're not paying the right amount of child support. So all those duties are still there. The new duty is this business right here about the importance of telling the judge about child protection matters, civil protection orders and about criminal matters that are related to you and to your family. Um, next. Let's get into the business about, uh, oh, that, I went too far. Sorry, let's, let's get into the business about parenting after separation. So this, this, is the, uh, this is some really important new stuff here. So right now, the way we talk about parenting children, we use language like custody and access. 
Um, and that's common really throughout Canada. The only places where you tend not to see language like this is in Alberta, which got off to the mark early in 2005 and got rid of language about custody and access and instead talked about guardians who have parenting time with their children and the powers, uh, responsibilities and obligations, something like that about guardianship. British Columbia in 2013 introduced its new legislation and it also got rid of custody and access. Instead, the British Columbia legislation talks about people who are guardians and people who are guardians who have parenting time with their kids um, and have parental responsibilities for their children. Nova Scotia, I think, was the most recent uh, province to change its legislation on family law, and that was in 2015. It kept uh, the idea about custody, but it talked about parenting time, and it talked about people who aren't parents who might have contact with a child. So this general change, this sort of trend that we've seen starting in the provinces, is really finally now reflected in the Divorce Act. The other reason why it's important to get rid of language about custody and access, it's not because divorce, uh, Alberta and British Columbia got it right, although I think they did. Um, it's because, you know, words like custody kind of have a property flavor to them, right? Like you want custody of your child the way you want custody of your car. Um, and the rights that are involved in custody and access are the rights that parents have. They're not focused on the interests of children, right? And so what the Divorce Act has done, the changes to the Divorce Act have done is we're getting rid of those terms. Instead, we're using language that is much more focused on the interests and rights of children. So we're talking about parenting time. And I love that phrase because parenting time is an activity, right? Yeah, it's access, it's, your, it's the schedule you have of your time with the child. But when you have parenting time, you are engaged in the business of parenting your child. You are engaging in all of the tasks that are necessary to make sure that your child is properly nurtured and supported and uh, grows up into a functioning member of society. Now, as somebody who is a spouse and the parent of a child, you also have this brand new idea called decision-making responsibility. And this isn't particularly complicated. Essentially, it's the ability to make decisions on behalf of your child. So uh, it's about things like, where does the child go to school? Um, what languages does the child learn how to speak? Um, if, is the child raised in a religion? If so, which religion? What's the child's diet look like? So it's all about all these really important things about education and healthcare and sports activities and arts lessons and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so anytime you see on a school form where you have to, that's the permission of a parent or guardian is required, that is an exercise of decision-making responsibility. It's also an exercise of decision-making responsibility when your child gets sick and you give instructions to your child's doctor about how the child is to be cared for. So together, decisions about decision-making responsibility and parenting time are all called parenting orders. But there's this other thing called a contact order. The people who are presumed to have parenting time and decision-making responsibility are spouses, right? Remember, the Divorce Act only applies to people who are married to each other or who used to be married to each other. But it's possible that somebody who isn't a spouse might want to have time with a child. Um, quite often you see this when it's a grandparent. Um, so sometimes a parent will leave their child in the care of their own parent because uh, they are going away for work, uh, they're being posted overseas, uh, or even worse, uh, because they're struggling with an addiction and they're not capable of caring for the child themselves. Well, sometimes a grandparent who has had the child for years, you know, does not want to be cut out of their child's life when the parent is again able to care for the child. So somebody like that, aunts, uncles, grandparents, other important people in the child's life, have the ability to apply for contact. Now there's an important distinction between contact and parenting time that I'll get to in a second, but right away you kind of get the flavor, right? That parenting time is this schedule of engaged well, activity with your child where you are engaged in the business of parenting. Contact has more of that flavor of access, that drive-by kind of feeling where, you know, you're not engaged in parenting. It's just time that you happen to have with the child. So 
More new terms, not too bad. We've already run into family dispute resolution process, and we know that family dispute resolution process refers to negotiation, collaborative negotiation and mediation, as well as other out of court processes. Then we have a new definition of a term family member. Don't worry about that. The definition is only important for the new definition of family violence. Now, this definition is also really important. Family violence is defined in the changes to the Divorce Act as behavior that is violent, threatening, or constitutes a pattern of coercive controlling behavior that causes a family member, and that's where that term is used, to fear for their own safety or for that of another person. It includes sexual abuse, harassment, financial abuse, psychological abuse, and the failure to provide your spouse or your child with the necessities of life. So this is really important because it makes it clear that when we're talking about family violence, it's not just physical abuse. It also includes financial abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and all these other things. It's a very, very, very big term. So remember, remember how big that term is. And we're gonna run into family violence again in just a few more minutes. Then carrying on with the new terms, there's one new term that you need to write down and underline, and it's uh, the definition of the term relocation. Relocation is a complicated multisyllabic way of saying moving. And a, and a move that qualifies as a relocation under the Divorce Act is a move of a spouse or of a child or both, where the move is likely to have a significant impact on the child's relationship with someone who has parenting time someone who has decision-making responsibility, somebody who has contact, and somebody who is in the middle of applying for parenting orders. And we're gonna get back to that a bit more uh, later when I talk about moving. So carrying on, section 16 is where we have that new best interests of the child test. This is really important because it's, it's, it's the framework within which the court makes decisions about contact, parenting time, and decision-making responsibility. Now, the current Divorce Act hardly says anything about the best interests of a child. There's this throwaway line that says, the only thing the court can think about when making decisions about custody or access is the child's best interests. But the legislation doesn't tell us what we have to think about when the court is being asked to consider the child's best interests. In fact, there's only one line that adds anything to that, and that's later on in section 16 in subsection 10, which says that the court, uh, as a general rule, should give as much time uh, with the child to each parent as is consistent with the best interests of the child. But that's it. The funny thing is, is that the provincial legislation about parenting after separation has always gone into a lot more detail about providing a shopping list of factors that the court has to think about. And that idea of that long shopping list of factors is what we now have in the brand new section 16. So section 16, subsection one says the only thing the court can think about when making decisions about children, and again, we're talking about parenting responsibilities, we're talking about parenting time, and we're talking about contact. The only thing the court can think about is the child's best interests. Now, under subsection two, uh, it says, the court shall give primary consideration to the child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety, security, and well-being. This is important because what it's doing is it's setting up these three primary considerations within which everything else has to fall, right? Now, the long list of factors to think about are start at section 16, subsection three, and they include, among other things, the child's needs, given the child's age and stage of development, the nature of the child's relationship with the other spouse and with the other important people in the child's life, each spouse's willingness to support the child's relationship with the other spouse. That's going to be hugely important in cases where a child is resisting seeing a parent after separation. The history of the child's care is another factor. And another factor are the child's 
own views and preferences. This is important because since 1991, Canada has been a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the, on the Rights of the Child. Um, and the UN Convention is basically a bill of rights for kids. Um, it talks about uh, all the human rights children have, such as uh, the right to education, the right not to be separated from parents, um, the rights to a nutritious diet and things like that. But it also says at Article 12 of the Convention, that uh, the governments that have signed the convention are required to allow kids to express their views in any court proceeding affecting their interests if the child wants to do that. This finally is what's being reflected in the Divorce Act. And here's the thing about the exact language of this part of the Divorce Act. It creates something that lawyers call a rebuttable presumption. In other words, it creates a presumption that children's views will be heard and you can rebut that presumption or challenge it only on the basis that the child's views cannot be ascertained. So in other words, there's a legal obligation to hear what children think about the decisions that the court is being asked to make. And the only way you can get out of having that happen is if you can prove that the child's views cannot be understood. So why would that happen? When would that happen? Well, uh, because a child is pre-verbal. Uh, mainly because the child is just too young to be able to articulate views and preferences, and that's fine. I think the other reason why you might not be able to ascertain a child's views might be because uh, the child is suffering from a profound disability that affects their ability to express themselves, something like that. Carrying on, the other factors include the child's cultural indigenous uh, identity and heritage. Also, uh, what are the plans that each spouse has for the care of the child? Um, what is the ability that each spouse has to care for and meet the needs of the child? And then, here's a brand new factor, the presence of family violence and the impact of that violence on a spouse's ability to care for a child and on the appropriateness of any order, whether it's a parenting time or decision-making responsibility that requires the spouses to communicate with each other. So, British Columbia's Family Law Act, which, as I said, came in, became law in 2013, really set out a template for the federal government. Uh, and in fact, the changes to the Divorce Act really seemed like it was sort of a great big cut and paste from the British Columbia Family Law Act into the Divorce Act. And that's fine, especially if you're from British Columbia, because it means you're not having to learn this all over again, right? The new Divorce Act is going to look pretty much like your current Family Law Act. Under British Columbia's legislation, family violence is also one of the long list of best interests of the child factors. And under the Family Law Act, when family violence is present, it refers to another section that has an additional level of factors that the court has to take into account in order to figure out what is the impact of family violence. The Divorce Act does the same thing. So if family violence is present under, under section 16, subsection three, you then have to go to the additional factors that are listed at section 16, subsection 4. Those factors include the nature, seriousness, and frequency of the violence, whether the family violence demonstrates a pattern of coercive controlling behavior, whether the violence uh, was directed to the child or to the other spouse, whether the child was directly or indirectly exposed to the violence. Um, and here's an important point. The steps that have been taken by the person who committed the violence to prevent further violence and to improve their ability to care for a child. Now, this is important because if you're the person who is accused of being violent in the relationship, you need to think about what steps have I taken, what steps can I take that will help me refrain from being abusive in the future and help me put the needs of my child first. So think about that because if this is an issue, there are programs all over Canada that you can take that will help you better address family violence. So we've just gone through the really important section 16 and all the new rules about uh, how you figure out children's best interests. So um, when the court, uh, so this, under section 16.1, the court is able to make those orders about parenting time and decision-making responsibility. That section says that the people who can ask for these orders are people who are spouses, but 
other people can also ask for parenting time or decision-making responsibility with the court's permission. So this is sort of about grandparents, you know, and other family members who maybe have had a really important role raising the child and don't want to be cut out of the child's life and still want to have a role in making decisions about kids. They can apply for, the, for parenting time and decision-making responsibility as well, but they have to get permission of the court first. The other people who can apply for parenting time or decision-making responsibility with permission are people who are parents. So if you think about it, right, we're talking about the two spouses who are involved in a claim under the Divorce Act. A parent would be the other biological parent of the child who isn't married to the two people that are involved in this proceeding, right? So essentially, there's one spouse who's a biological parent, the other spouse who was a step-parent, and then the other parent who isn't a spouse who might also want to ask the court for permission to ask for parenting time and decision-making responsibility. Now, when the court makes orders about parenting time, it will normally set out a schedule. And what's really important about parenting time is that it's both spouses who have parenting time. Under the old Divorce Act, when we talked about access, we would talk about one parent who had the children's primary residence, and access referred to the schedule of this parent's time with the children. Under the new Divorce Act, both people have parenting time. The parenting time is the time when the child is with you and you're raising the child. So that's easy enough. It's also important to know that the Divorce Act doesn't contain any presumptions about how parenting time should be split up, including that parenting time should be divided equally between spouses. So there's no presumptions. It's all about what's in the best interests of the child. Then when it comes to decision-making responsibilities, I have a feeling that how the law is going to shake out is that both spouses will be presumed to share responsibility for all the decisions that need to be made concerning a child, right? Which means that uh, it isn't the case that one spouse would be making decisions about education while the other one makes decisions about healthcare. They would both make those decisions and they would both have to talk to each other about it. But the court has the ability under section 16.1 to allocate those different types of things that you might make decisions about between parents. Sometimes you hear this referred to as parallel parenting. In general, this sort of allocation of decision-making responsibility is reserved for cases where the parents just cannot get along with each other. They're in huge amounts of conflict or when uh, the parents just can't agree about something fundamental. Um, and the best example I can think of about that kind of basic disagreement is um, where you have parents when one of them is a Jehovah's Witness and the child needs a blood transfusion. Well, in that religion, uh, transfusions are considered to be sinful. Uh, the, the other parent who's not a Jehovah's Witness might say, well, you know, modern medical science says that my child needs a transfusion. That's what they're going to get. And there's no compromise that's possible between must not and should. Right. So in a case like that, and in cases of high conflict, the court might allocate those spheres of decision making responsibility so that one spouse might be responsible for making decisions about education, sports activities, extracurricular activities. The other spouse might have sole responsibility for making decisions about health care. Who knows? So, so it could work like that. You don't know. And it's always going to depend, again, on what's in the best interests of the child. This section also allows the court to make other orders uh, that are important for orders about parenting time and decision-making responsibility. These include orders that a parent's parenting time with the child has to be supervised by some independent third party just to make sure that the child is safe. It could include orders that somebody's parenting time is conditional upon them doing or not doing something. Um, so for example, uh, parenting time might be conditional about not driving with the child or about what if you drive with the child, making sure the child is wearing a seatbelt. Um, or another condition might, not, might be to not smoke around the child, stuff like that. Um, the court can also, when it's making a parenting order, uh, send the parties off to family dispute resolution, which is kind of cool. The whole idea that the judge might say, you have to go see a mediator. That's great. I mean, frankly, anything that can get you out of court is in general a good thing. Um, and then under sections 16.2, 16.3, and 16.4, the court can do other things. And this is really, these sections are really sort of listing what's involved in having an order for parenting time. And this too is really important. 
So under section 16.2, somebody who has parenting time has the exclusive right to make day-to-day -day decisions about their kids when their kids are with them during their parenting time. Most of the time, this is going to be kind of boring, mundane stuff like, you know, what should my child have for lunch? Uh, it's raining outside. Should the kid wear sandals or rubber boots? Like big critical decisions like that. But it also includes emergency decisions. Like if the child gets sick or breaks a leg while they're with you, you have the ability during your parenting time to just take the kids straight to the hospital without having to worry about consulting with the other spouse and getting their agreement. So important to remember, if you have parenting time, you have the ability to make day-to-day -day decisions about the child without having to consult the other spouse during your parenting time with the child. Under section 16.4, if you are someone who has parenting time or decision-making responsibility, you also have the right to ask for and get information about the child's well-being, health, and education from anybody who happens to have that information, whether it's the other spouse, your child's teacher, your child's doctor, counselor, things like that. That's really important because if you are somebody who is not a spouse, and has contact, you don't have the right to make day-to-day -day decisions concerning the child when the child is with you, and you don't have the right to ask for and get information about the child's well-being, um, their education, or their health care. Um, we have a question from Chris. Chris says, do day-to-day -day decisions include putting them in the care of a babysitter or your new partner while you work? Sometimes that might be the case. Um, Normally, stuff like about childcare um, are things that, because they cost money, both spouses wind up having to talk about because it's about a decision about, you know, do we spend money on this babysitter or that babysitter, this aunt or that uncle? Uh, because normally the cost of things like that is shared between spouses. I would hope that spouses wouldn't find themselves arguing about exactly who it is that's caring for the child when they're unable to care for them themselves but uh, I can see that that might become the subject of a dispute. So I think a day-to-day -day decision is more along the lines of impermanent, random, sudden things involving kids about what do they have for lunch and things like that, and about important things that are sudden and unexpected like healthcare emergencies. So before I agree that putting the child in with a sitter or some other daycare provider as a day-to-day decision-making, uh, as a day-to-day -day function, I think that's probably more likely to be the kind of thing that because it can involve the child's welfare uh, and legitimate concerns by a spouse about who the child, who, who is looking after the child, I would say that in all probability, this is gonna be the kind of thing that probably falls into the head of per parental responsibilities. Um, so then getting back to the contact thing just for a second, remember that if you're a spouse, what you have with your child is parenting time. If you're not a spouse, you have contact. Somebody who has contact doesn't have day-to-day -day decision making authority and they don't have the right to get information about the child. But in order to ask for contact, you have to get permission from the court first. You have to get leave, okay? Um, so. Uh, the court, when it makes a contact order, can impose terms and conditions, just like it can on a parenting time order, about things like uh, the, your, your contact needs to be supervised by a third party, um, your contact is conditional upon you not smoking or not drinking around the child. Uh, the court can also make it a condition of your contact that you not remove the child from a particular place, or a particular city, or a particular province. And the court can make orders about how you communicate with the other parents in order to reduce conflict and stuff like that. Um, then finally on this front, there's this other new term called parenting plan. And this shows up at the new section 16.6. And a parenting plan is defined as a part of a document that spouses agree to that talks about contact, parenting time, and decision-making responsibilities. And what this section says is that when the court's making an order about kids, it has to include the parts of a parenting plan in that, but it doesn't have to do that if it thinks that the parenting plan is not in the best interests of the child. So this is a backdoor way to getting the court the authority to change agreements that you and your spouse might make if the court thinks that they're no longer in the best interests of the child. So now finally, let's get talking about relocation, the whole bit about moving after separation. So that definition, let's just have a quick refresh. 
Relocation is defined as a change in the residence of a child or of a person who has parenting time or decision-making responsibility that may have a significant impact on the child's relationship with other people, with parenting time, decision-making responsibilities, or contact. So I would expect that a move within a city is not going to qualify as a relocation. The kind of thing that's going to qualify as a relocation is a move to a place that's far away enough to make the current schedule of parenting time or the current contact schedule impossible or at least extremely difficult, right? Um, and gosh, I had something really important to say. I just totally forgotten what that was. Ah, yes, I remember now. The important, the other important thing is that it's not just a change in the residence of a child. This applies to people who have parenting time or decision-making responsibilities who plan on even moving without the child. So if you happen to have parenting time and you've got uh, an urge to move out of Toronto to scenic and lovely Barrie, that's without a doubt a, re, uh, some, a move that would qualify as a relocation. But even if it's just you who plans to move there and you're not planning on taking the kids, that still qualifies as a relocation. In the vast majority of cases that lawyers typically deal with about mobility and relocation and moving after separation, however, the concern is about a child who's being asked to move away. So, as you can tell from this definition, there are moves that are going to qualify as relocations because they're likely to have an impact on the child's relationship with someone else. But then there are these moves, like within a city, that wouldn't qualify as a relocation. So, Here's the first bit of the really important new rules. If you are planning on moving, even if it doesn't qualify as a relocation, you are required to give notice of your intention to move to anybody else who has parenting time, decision-making responsibility, or contact. The notice you have to give needs to be in writing. It has to state the date that you're planning on moving and where you're moving to. And it has to provide the new contact information for the child. You can, if you want, apply to court for leave to forget the notice requirement if there's been family violence. You don't get to do it just because you say there's been family violence, you still need to get the court's permission. When you do have a move that qualifies as a relocation, you also have to give notice. Under section 16.9, if you're planning on moving, and again, moving with or without your child, you have to give 60 days notice to anybody who has parenting time decision-making responsibility or contact with the child. The notice has to be in writing. It has to state the date that you're planning on moving. It has to give your new information and the new contact information for yourself or the child. And you have to provide a proposal for how the existing arrangements for parenting time and decision-making responsibilities and contact could still be exercised if the move goes ahead. Now, the cool thing is, is that the government, the federal government has developed a form. Uh, the form I'm gonna show you in a bit, it's super easy to fill out. You can do it online. It comes in a fillable PDF form. It's super easy and very simple and straightforward. So you want to move, you've given notice. Um, you can apply for exemption from the requirement that you give notice if there's been family violence. And again, you have to get the court's permission. You don't just get to decide this on your own. Now, somebody who has contact is entitled to that 60 day notice that you're planning on moving with or without the child. And that's good, but they don't get to object to it. It's mostly for their information. On the other hand, somebody else, typically your ex-spouse who has parenting time or decision-making responsibilities, they're also entitled to that 60 days notice, but they're entitled to object. There are two ways to object. You can object by filing an application in court to stop the move from going, or you can object by filling out one of the brand new forms that's been created by the Department of Justice. So this is really important, right? Because if you don't object, the court can allow the move to go ahead. The, the new section about mobility says, and this is at 16.91, you can relocate if the court says it's okay that you can relocate, or you can relocate if you've given notice, 30 days have gone by without getting an objection from a spouse who says, oh no, you can't move. And there's no other order or agreement in place that stops you from moving. 
just like British Columbia's fancy new mobility test, relocation test. The sections that talk about relocation also give the court a list of other factors that the court has to think about when it's deciding whether a relocation should be allowed or not. So the court has to think about, most importantly, the best interest factors at section 16 that we just finished talking about, the long list of factors, plus the additional factors about family violence. But section 16.92, also give some additional factors that the court has to think about when, when the court's being asked to consider a move. But the section also says that the court cannot consider whether you would still go if the child wasn't allowed to go with you. That's important. So those additional factors include why you want to relocate. And typically people do that because they have a job, they have a new partner, they're getting married, they have uh, health care or educational uh, needs that can only be met in the place they want to go to. So you've got to say what your reasons for wanting to move are. The court has to think about the impact of the relocation on the child, uh, specifically with respect to how the child's going to feel about moving away from friends and family other people who have decision-making responsibility, uh, who have parenting time and so forth. The court also has to think about, did you comply with your obligation to give notice and the content of the notice when you were talking about moving? And finally, the court has to think about, are there any orders, agreements, or are arbitrators awards out that stop you from moving? So if the court authorizes the relocation, the court can also make an order about the costs of exercising parenting time. That's really important because way back when I had a case where uh, my client um, or the child, yeah, the, my, my client and his spouse lived in Haida Gwaii, just off the coast of British Columbia. And then uh, mom uh, uh, relocated to the lower mainland. And I can't tell you how much it costs to get from Haida Gwaii to Surrey in British Columbia. You've got a, a really long ferry drive and you've got a whole lot, a, 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 whole, a ferry trip and a whole lot of driving to take into account. It takes a lot of time, like two days, and it costs a lot of money. So the good news about things like this is that whether the move is from Haida Gwaii to Vancouver or the move is from Ottawa to Toronto, you can ask for an order that, you're, that the spouse who is moving share some of the costs that you're going to incur seeing your child in the, in the new location. The other thing that's important is that if the court does allow a relocation, that's enough for you to apply to court to change the arrangements that have been made about parental responsibilities and about parenting time. On the other hand, if the court says, no, you can't go, that's not an excuse for you to apply to change the, the rules about parenting, about uh, decision-making responsibility, or about contact. So that's a little thing that's going to come up for some people in some cases, but not, not often to a lot of people. Finally, there's one really important thing that's a little bit in the confusing side, so please bear with me. When lawyers talk about the burden of proof, what we mean is who has the responsibility to prove that something is or is not the case. In this particular case, the way the new provisions of the Divorce Act work, the people, the person who has the burden of proof changes, and it changes depending on how the child's parenting time is working out, right? So firstly, if the child spends substantially equal time with both spouses, it's the spouse who wants to relocate, who has the burden of showing that the relocation is in the best interests of the child. On the other hand, if the person who wants to relocate has the child for the vast majority of the child's time, the burden lies on the person who isn't moving to show that the move is a bad idea and not in the best interests of the child. But obviously, there's going to be a whole bunch of cases where the child isn't spending the vast majority of their time with one spouse or spending a substantially equal amount of time with both spouses. When you're in that kind of middle zone, both of you have the responsibility of showing either that the move is in the best interest of the child or it's not in the best interest of the child. So just bear in mind that the, the, key, the key bits about relocation are this. They apply whether you're moving by yourself or want to move with the child as well. You have to give notice, 60 days written notice to anybody else who has parenting time, decision-making responsibility or contact with the child. People who have contact are entitled to notice, but they can't argue about it. 
On the other hand, people with parenting time or decision-making responsibility are entitled to notice and they can object. If you don't object within time, that may be enough for the person who wants to go to just simply go. But if you do object in time and the court has to make a decision about whether the relocation should go ahead, if the person who moves has the child for the vast majority of their time, it's up to the person who's staying behind to argue that the move is not in the best interest of the child. On the other hand, if the child's time is split more or less equally between spouses, it's the job of the person who wants to move to prove that the move is in the best interests of the child. So this is the really big stuff. Oh. Um, Wendy says, are people with contact obliged to inform people with decision-making responsibility and parenting time or contact that they are planning to move? As a matter of fact, that is true. They do. They have to give that written notice, and there's a form for that as well, but nobody objects to that. It's just saying, hey, I'm moving. This is my new contact information. This is where I'm going to, and this is when I'm moving. So the changes to the child support guidelines, there are a few, it's not a big deal, so don't panic. The, the child support guidelines are a regulation to the Divorce Act that talks about how we calculate child support when there is a child support obligation. So really the big changes there are some jurisdictional stuff that only lawyers need to worry about. But the big thing is a change to accommodate the new language about parenting time. So split custody, under section eight of the child support guidelines is now known as split parenting time. This is a parenting arrangement where one or more children live with each spouse. So you might have a brother and a sister living with this spouse and you might have a brother living with this spouse. That's split parenting because they each have the primary residence of one or more of their kids. The other one that's a little bit more common, well, a lot more common, is shared custody. And that's a situation where each of the parents has the kids for at least 40% of the kids' time. We're not going to call it shared custody anymore. It's now going to be called shared parenting time. Okay, easy peasy. That takes care of the changes to the Divorce Act. Now, the new forms. Well, the, new, the court forms, depending on where you live, have to be changed to adapt to the new language in the Divorce Act. Most provinces and territories have court forms that have like a checkbox kind of approach. I am asking for a divorce. I am asking for parenting time. So all the language about parenting time, about contact and about decision-making responsibility will need to get changed, even in provinces like British Columbia that use similar but not identical legislation. So that all has to get changed. Another change is that we now need a new spot where you, as a party to a Divorce Act proceeding, can certify that you are aware of your duties under sections 7.1 through to 7.5. Um, the other thing that's, uh, oh, and here, here is, by the way, what that certification looks like. A as I said before, it's just a matter of this little bit that's going to come pre-printed at the bottom of those court forms, and you just write your name down where it says name of party, you check the box, and then you sign your data beneath it, and that's it. Your duty to certify has been taken care of. Congratulations. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's the new certificate. Uh, the other changes, like I said, are going to be about uh, changing the names of things like parenting time and decision-making responsibility. The Divorce Act, however, also gives us some new forms, and the forms are about relocation. The forms are a notice of relocation form that's used by a spouse who wants to move away with or without the child. There is an objection to relocation form, which, as you guessed it, is used by a spouse who says, no, man, I'm not happy with you moving. And then there's that other uh, form that Wendy asked about, the notice of change in place of residence for people with contact. All these forms are available through the Department of Justice website. And what's really awesome is that the government has finally managed to master 21st century technology. And so the forms are available as fillable PDFs that you just download to your computer and fill out by typing in them. Uh, or there's a form that's available online where you fill it out online and there's, there's a print button which generates the form for you. This is what the notice of relocation form looks like. Um, the blue bits are from the fillable PDF and you just, you just click, on, click your mouse on the blue bit and you start typing. And as you can see, it's basically a fill in the blanks kind of thing. Uh, so what's your name? Where do you live? What's your phone number, your email address? You know, are you planning on going with, without the kids? Are you planning on going with the kids? and so on. Uh, next page, also simple. When are you planning on moving? What's the place that you're moving to? What's your new contact information? Easy peasy. And then there's a page which is nothing but a big blue box. And this is where you have to
to put that proposal about how the parenting arrangements and contact could work if the move goes ahead, okay? And then the last page is the usual bit that you often see in court forms that tells the other side, hey, by the way, if you have a uh, decision-making responsibility or parenting time, you can object. These are the rules about objecting. This is what you have to do. And like I said, that form is also available on time, uh, online. Now, um, m most people who have already been through a Divorce Act proceeding will have a Divorce Act order. Um, it's quite commonplace that you may also have uh, an arbitrator's award, or you might happen to have a separation agreement that you've made with your spouse. Um, like I said uh, at the very beginning, the old language about things like custody, access, and guardianship may still be in your old agreement, your old order, or your old award. But don't worry, you don't have to go back to court to update these things. They're still good. But what you do need to figure out is how do I translate them? That's it. Okay. And you're translating it just for your own benefit, not because you're going to be asking for a brand new order. So the basic rules are these. If you are a spouse and under your Divorce Act order, agreement, or award, you have access, that means that you have parenting time with the kids. Um, if you are not a spouse and you have access to the kids, so you're a, 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 the other parent, your grandmother, aunt, uncle, something like that, you don't have parenting time. You have contact. Remember how I said that under the new rules, both spouses have parenting time? Well, what that means is that if you're a spouse and your ex-spouse has time with the kids, you have parenting time too. Your parenting time is the time when the kids are not supposed to be with the other parent under the existing access order. Um, if you have custody of the kids, whether you have sole custody joint custody or shared custody, you now have decision-making responsibilities, not custody. Um, and what's important to know is that the change between the old Divorce Act language and the new Divorce Act language doesn't give you any more decision-making responsibilities than you previously had under the old order or the old agreement or the old arbitrator's award. So just because the name is changing doesn't mean that you now have decision-making responsibility for everything. If it was the case that these rights and responsibilities were split up between you and your spouse. The other thing is that uh, if you have parenting time or decision-making responsibility under these new rules of translation, um, you also have the right to ask for and get information about your child's education, health, and general well-being. And you also have that right to make day-to-day -day decisions about the children when they're with you. Important to remember is that if you're not a spouse, you have contact, not access. And as somebody who has contact, you don't have the right to have day-to-day -day decision making responsibility, and you don't have the right to ask for and get information about the kids. Now, I have just blown through a really long and complicated bill. We've talked about the changes to the child support guidelines. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. We've talked about the changes to the court forms, and we've talked about the new forms the federal government has created to deal with relocation issues. So this is your opportunity now to ask me any questions that might happen to come to your mind. So uh, David says, is there a guideline the courts will follow to allow a relocation to happen? Say a distance from a parent that has access, but not the custodial parent, especially if the move is a short distance, but far enough to cause a conflict in access. Well, so David, what you're talking about is the definition of what relocation means. I'm just gonna scroll back up and see if I can quickly find that. And here it is. So the guideline is really that definition about what qualifies as a relocation and what doesn't. The basic idea is that it has to have an impact. The proposed move has to have an impact on the child's relationship with somebody else, somebody who's the other spouse or another adult who has an important role in the child's life. And so the, the federal government hasn't said, you know, X number of kilometers or X number of hours of driving. The question is, what you, is, is how you've described it, David, as a conflict in the access. In other words, um, I live in Calgary right now. I work throughout Alberta and British Columbia, but Calgary is now my home. I can move within Calgary, and because Calgary is a fairly small city and the traffic isn't that bad, anywhere I move within Calgary is probably not going to be more than 40 minutes, maybe 50 minutes away from where I used to live at the outside. Most of the time, 
parenting arrangements are going to be able to accommodate that kind of a short trip. But if I decided to move from Calgary to Red, uh, to Red Deer, for example, which is about an hour and a half outside of Calgary, that might be too far. That kind of a trip may interfere with the parenting schedule or the contact schedule. In a case like that, it will in all likelihood, in fact, most definitely qualify as a relocation. And if it qualifies as a relocation, that's when the new, the new rules kick in. Wendy asks another question. She says, how does the court quantify an effect on the child's relationship with another person? No idea. This points to one of the really important things, uh, one of the important functions judges provide. The job of judges is not just to make decisions, but to interpret and apply the law. And so when we see, and I'm going to scroll to another spot again, when we see this business about the burden of proof, for example, right, there is no statutory definition of what this phrase, substantially equal time means, and there's no statutory definition about what vast majority means. And this is weird, uh, if not unfortunate, because as a lawyer, if I'm giving advice to you about whether or not the relocation application is going to succeed, I'm going to have a really hard time doing that. First, I have to make that subjective decision about whether the relocation is the kind that's going to cause a significant impact on the child's relationship. And then if I'm going to give you advice, I have to figure out, well, do you and your spouse have substantially equal time with the child? Or does the child have the vast majority of the child's time with this spouse or with that spouse. The thing is, with no definition, we can't tell. It's going to be hard for me to give you that advice. And so we're going to have to wait for the courts to figure all this stuff out, to make rules that help us understand. So when the child support guidelines came into effect in 1997, for example, that section nine that I told you about before about shared custody, it said, um, if the payor of child support has the children for 40% or more of the child's time, then the court may make an order about child support that's different than what the tables have to say. But maybe it's just the fact that lawyers are lawyers, or maybe it's that people are people. But all these arguments came up about how do you count to 40%? So some parents said, well, who gets credit for the time when the child is sleeping? Who gets credit for the time when the child is in school? And over time, we had court decisions that told us how to understand whether a parent has 40% or not. And the rules were developed. And, and, and so that's what we needed. And now nobody argues, well, hardly ever argues about whether or not a parenting schedule meets that 40% threshold. But it took years, probably about 10 years, before the case law was sufficiently developed and sufficiently robust to help us understand that. So the, the federal government chose to say, substantially equal instead of equal. You and I, we know what equal means. It's 50%. And, you know, that's obvious. But what does substantially equal mean? Clearly, it's not 50%. It's something different. So we're going to have to wait for the court to tell us what that means. Same thing with vast majority. I mean, we know what majority means. It's 50% plus one. What does vast majority mean? I don't know. Is it 85%? Is it 62%? Is it 93%? I don't know. We're going to have to wait and find out. The same way that we're going to have to wait and find out whatever it is that significant impact means. So we're going to have to wait and find out. But following up on David's question and Wendy's question together, what, we're, what I think that we're going to be looking at is something that makes the exercise of the existing schedule of parenting time or contact an impossibility or really begins to impact on how the parenting time gets worked out. Um, we have a question from Adele. Adele says, does mediation and that sort of thing include attending at judicial case conferences and family case conferences as a part of the litigation process? So what Adele is talking about is uh, something that's special to British Columbia. Um, and these are meetings between the parties to a divorce act proceeding and the judge. And what the judge tries to do is tries to identify the problems that people are dealing with, uh, help people reach agreements, uh, and make orders about the steps that have to be taken to get the litigation really moving, right? Um, so I think that technically speaking, the sort of work that a judge does 
at a family case conference or a judicial case conference would meet the definition of family dispute resolution process. But I don't think that's the meaning that the Divorce Act has in mind. These parts of the Divorce Act are about getting people out of court and trying something different to resolve their disputes. Um, and so uh, while I think that you could say, yes, this is a family dispute resolution process, and without a doubt it is, the purpose of that part of the Divorce Act is to really encourage people to get the hell out of court altogether, right? And the part of the Divorce Act that allows the judge to direct people into a family dispute resolution process is also about kicking people out of court. It's not about come back to court for a different kind of court event called a judicial case conference. So um, that takes care of Adele's question. The questions raised by Chris, Wendy, and David. Uh, I am here and at your disposal. Um, I booked this for an hour and a half, but there's no particular magic for that. I can take as long as you want. Um, I can also be as brief as you want. But if you have any questions at all about the changes to the Divorce Act, please go ahead, ask them. If you want, you could unmute your microphone and say your question, or, or you can also use the chat box to type out your question. So please go right ahead and ask me questions. Thank you very much, Wendy. I appreciate that. So I'll give it a few more minutes. Uh, and if you have any questions that you want to ask, please go right ahead. Mm. What I will do is I will redistribute this, this presentation so that you've got a copy of it. So hang on a sec and I will share it through the chat box. And I'm sharing it now. It's a seven megabyte file. So it's going to take a little while to get sucked up from my computer to the internet, but here it goes. So please, if you have any questions, go ahead. Now's the time. Okay, well, I don't see any new questions and I don't hear any new questions. So I guess with that, I'll just say thank you very much everybody for coming. I hope that this helped to address any questions that you might have. Oh, uh, sorry, there's a question. David says, in the simple form, what changes are coming to child support? Uh, there aren't any changes that are coming to child support. Really, the changes to the child support guidelines are just about uh, how you interpret and understand some of the language that the guidelines use, like about shared custody and split custody. And that's not changing the substance, the nuts and bolts of the guidelines or the child support tables. It's just changing the language that we use under section eight on split custody and section nine on shared custody. All right. So uh, then in that case, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, and please don't hesitate to go to my firm website to download a copy of the Consolidated Divorce Act that I've prepared. Uh, and like I said, please feel free to distribute uh, and pass these things around as you wish. Oh, one last question from Deborah. Deborah says, do we know in the wording used under the child youth and the child protection legislation uh, has, the, has the wording changed, I suppose, is what Deborah is asking. Um, so, in, so this is a complicated question because it's about law reform. Um, in British Columbia and in Alberta, the legislation got rid of old terms like custody and access quite some time ago. Those changes haven't necessarily percolated into all of the other rules that talk about kids and parents caring for children. So for example, the School Act, uh, in Alberta or the Infants Act in British Columbia uh, still talk about custody and guardianship and access. And the child protection legislation still tends to talk about custody and access. What's really important though is that the Divorce Act is that is a law of Canada, right? It's not a provincial law, it's, it's on another level altogether. So in general, when the provinces make changes to their laws, they, they eventually get around to changing things like the CFCSA in British Columbia to match the language used in the Family Law Act, but it takes them time. But they're under no obligation at all to adapt to reflect changes in the federal legislation. That's an entirely different subject. So, ah, uh, so... I think uh, David says, I heard the word in two about the term parent is being tweaked. Okay, so that's another important point. The Divorce Act, like I said, applies to people who are spouses, 
right? That's all it applies to, because it only applies to people who are or who used to be married to each other, right? The uh, legislation that tends to talk about who is a parent tends to be the provincial legislation, uh, such as the Family Law Act uh, here in Alberta and in British Columbia, or the Child the Children's Law Reform Act in Ontario, or the Parenting and Support Act in Nova Scotia, right? That language tends to talk about parents, because the Divorce Act is just for spouses. So if there's going to be a tweak in what the word parent means, the tweak is probably going to happen in the context of provincial legislation, not federal legislation. And Aria, um, I have just sent out the slide presentation uh, through the chat dialog box. So you should be able to download it uh, through there. And if you just scroll up a little bit, I sent it out at 3.11 p.m. my time. And so you should just be able to click on that and it, and it should open up in, uh, in your browser or perhaps even offer to download it. So I will uh, call it a day. Uh, and uh, Chris, uh, you've asked me a question about an affidavit you were served with. And what I would say about that is go speak to a lawyer in Red Deer. You don't have to hire the lawyer to represent you. You don't have to ask them for anything more than just help with just responding to that one affidavit. But it's but it, but I, I'm not going to be providing legal services to the folks on the phone. This is not why I've done this presentation. Speak to somebody local, okay? All right. Thanks very much, everybody. If uh, something comes up and you have a question or a concern, feel free to drop me a line, give me a call, and uh, there you go. So thanks very much, everybody, and uh, have a good rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye.